This is an exclusive excerpt from the Stuff File program with Peter Anthony Holder. Barry Livingston is best known for his role as Ernie in the classic 60s sitcom My Three Sons. He's a true Hollywood survivor who has continued to work as an actor into adulthood. He's written about his experiences in his new book, The Importance of Being Ernie, From My Three Sons to Mad Men, A Hollywood Survivor Tells All. Barry joins us on the line right now from California. Hi, Barry. Hey, how's it going? Jess, tickety-boo. And i got to mention, I love the title of the book, The Importance of Being Ernie. <laughs> yeah, well, occasionally we get it right. Uh, that one just seemed to be a natural. You, you've written this book now. You've been an actor basically all of your life. Why now for this book? Well, you know, it, I did the show, My Three Sons, which is what I'm best known for, for playing Ernie. It had reached a, an anniversary. It reached the 50-year mark, which in itself is stunning. A half a century is, is crazy. Uh, so that was in my mind. And then, you know, I've had so many experiences with people real showbiz icons, um, you know, from yesterday, people like Jerry Lewis and Jackie Gleason and Fred McMurray and, you know, Lucille Ball. I, and I've told stories to people over the years, just, you know, just things that happened, just interactions between me and Elvis Presley, people like that. And they said, oh, these are great stories. you got to write them. So I thought, yeah, you know, and then, and then the trajectory of my life has been such that I had this great fame early on. The middle part was kind of... A, a downer, not necessarily like catastrophic, but but you know, I mean, I, I I was out of work and had some issues with some substance abuse things, nothing nothing catastrophic or something I couldn't control myself. Eventually, and then I rebounded, put my career back on track, and you know, luckily I've been working with people like Robert Downey Jr. and Brad Pitt and Katie Holmes. So you know, it was an interesting trajectory, and I thought, hey, you know, there's a book there. You know, that, that was really the impetus. Well, let's go back to when you first went on to the uh, series My Three Sons. You'd already been a veteran of television for many years at that point, but and and, and you joined My Three Sons in the first in the third season. And I'm just kind of curious: was it kind of weird playing the adoptive brother of your actual blood relative brother? <laughs> Well, yeah, I guess, you know, it wasn't obviously a big stretch for me to perceive him as my brother because we were brothers. But, uh, you know, I, I originally came on, you know, as a friend next door. That was my first entry into My Three Sons when I played Ernie Thompson. And, of course, uh, when Tim Considine decided to leave the show, and he was the original oldest son, Mike, they needed, you know, somebody to make the show Three Sons again. And I was, luckily for me, kind of hanging out in the bullpen waiting for that call. And and uh, so, yeah, you know, I didn't even, when I first came on the show, no, they didn't even mention that I was, you know, a foster child. You know, that only, that came to light around the time they needed somebody to be adopted into the show. So uh, it was, you know, not not a strange dynamic because my brother and I had worked on a couple other shows before. We uh, did some stuff on the Ozzie and Harriet show, and we, in fact, we even played brothers on the, my very first film. was a film called Rally Around the Flag Boys with Paul Newman and Joanne Woodward. So, you know, it was um, it was fun. You know, that's that's the best way to put it for me off the set. And, you know, people, people certainly bought it that we were brothers, that's for sure. Having gone through the Hollywood system as a child actor, when you work today, um, I'm, I'm sure from time to time you have the opportunity to work with kids today. How different is it for kids in Hollywood to work now than it was when you were a kid? Well, they're, you know, I mean, I guess the anytime you get a lot of money and you're a kid and you're famous, you're, you know, it's, a, it's sort of a recipe for a potential disaster because kids, um, you know, are not fully f- informed on the dangers of of fame and and how you can, be, you know, be tempted with a lot of vices that people will be offering to you because you are famous and you certainly have the means to acquire them. Um, yeah, I, there wasn't so much of that when I was a kid. I mean, probably the worst case scenarios were parents that were not really looking out for their kids and maybe maybe using their, their money, you know, the kids, the money that they're making, instead of putting it away and saving it, you know, it was being squandered on, on luxuries that once the kid arrived at a point where he should have had some money, uh, around 18 years old, he found out he had no money. So, you know, those are a little bit different, um, and, you know, um, but but the process is pretty much the same. You know, you're you're a child actor, you go to the set, you do your scenes, um, you get famous, you know, and it, 
then again, you just got to hopefully have people looking out for you. In in today's world, we have uh, Twitter and Facebook and YouTube and, and the tabloids and TMZ. If that kind of stuff were around when you were a teenager growing up in television, would it have been more of a difficult situation? I mean... Well, you know, my mistakes I made out of out of sight from from the press and the public, you know, and and that's just the nature of being a teenager. You're gonna mess up, you know. I mean, what what teenager do you know that you know hasn't crashed his car, hasn't had an accident, did something crazy, got drunk, did you know? I mean, honestly, it really it's it's unfair to to hold kids who are famous today to such this in, incredibly a standard that nobody could could meet when you're that age. Granted, you know, you're you you people have some pretty spectacular uh, crashes, but you know, it, it's I was lucky, you know, my mistakes that I made, I made them and like any other teenager who's not famous, you get past them, you move on, your parents are mad at you for a while and you go on and you try to correct your behavior. But, you know, when when your behavior is held up under such a microscope and broadcast on every television set and newspaper showing your picture at the supermarket that you've really screwed up this time. You know, that, that's got to mess with your head. I, I feel sorry for some of these kids today. I really do. Did you really have the opportunity to enjoy what you were doing when you were a kid? And by that I mean, uh, was was it work? Was it was it fun? Did you realize just how lucky and fortunate, and yes, talented you were, to be able to do what you were doing as a kid? Well, I, I did enjoy it because the people I worked with were a lot of fun, and they they I think they had me very at their best interest. I mean, certainly they wanted me to, to be a, a contributor to the success of the show and were happy that I could do that. But I think they also cared that I, you know, that I, I wasn't exploited. I didn't really go on any giant publicity junkets and there was no Bernie dolls or, you know, any kind of merchandising based on bobbleheads, you know, or anything that I had to go out there and hawk for the, for the TV network. So, um, you know, I, my experience was pretty natural, I think, you know, as close to a normal childhood as you could get in that awkward kind of strange environment of being famous as a kid. I used to go back to public school every year. Um, you know, I had friends outside of the industry. You know, my parents turned down a lot of work when I was on a hiatus because they just wanted me to go back and have a relatively normal childhood growing up. So, uh, yeah, I think all of that, were, were they were all good decisions for me. When you look back uh, almost 40 years later, uh, more than 40 years later, when you look back at re either reruns or DVDs of, of My Three Sons, uh, what do you see? Do you, do you sit down and watch the show and enjoy the story for what it is, or are you thinking about what happened on the set or, or how you put that scene together? Do you get to enjoy the show like, like the rest of us did? Yeah, I think I do enjoy it more more objectively. Uh, you know, there was a time when it was on. It was, you know, a little bit strange to watch those shows. And, you know, but... And then the show has gone through different perceptions from the public. You know, there was a time right after My Three Sons went off the air, about 72, that it was considered to be, you know, this selling the public with some fake, unrealistic values of what an American family or any kind of family should be or could be. And, uh, you know, it was just, they were saying, oh, it was a big lie that, you know, that problems are solved in a half an hour. Well, you know, as it's at, over the years, you kind of get past all of the politics and the changing cultures, and, and suddenly you just look at it objectively. And you go, you know what, it was just a simple show, family-oriented, you know, small problems within a nuclear family, and and dealt with it with some comedy and, and wit, and uh, that's nothing more, you know, than, than really what they were in the 60s. But sometimes it takes a little distance, and I see them as being very funny. I mean, they're funnier than I ever thought they were when we were doing them. Uh, they were very well written, very well produced, and had great stars involved with Fred McMurray and William Demers, William Brawley. So, you know, they're... they're pretty quality. They really are. They've held up real well. I've had the opportunity to talk to several child actors or former child actors, and they, they seem to be in two camps. Those who would, wouldn't would mind if their own kids went into the business and those who would not. <laughs> where are yeah, you on that? I would, yeah, I mean, I'm sorry, go ahead. Where, where are you on that? Yeah, well, I would probably not encourage my kids, but if they wanted it, you have to want it. You just really, really have to want it. That's the only way to get into the into the business because you're, you're you're it's hard to encourage your kids to go 
for a future that's just loaded with rejection, you know, just loaded with ups and downs and, and just tremendous pitfalls of, of, but, you know, the, the upsides are wonderful, you know, I mean, the money is good, the fame is not a bad thing to have in your corner, uh, you, you know, the hours, you're treated well, you see the world, you know, if you're a movie star, uh, you know, there's some great, great things associated with it. So, yeah, but, you know, that's all I would tell my kids. I go, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to get you an agent. I'm not going to help out. You know, if you want it, you better go get it. Because I, I, number one, I think that's, you got to prove to me that you want it. And number two, uh, you know, I don't want to be in the position of feeling like I got you involved in it. And then perhaps you have some, you know, horrible reaction to it. And then I feel guilty that I pushed you into it. So, you know, if they want it, they can they can go get it. And I would certainly support them. But it's not, you know, it's not important to me or to, to, to you know, go out there and push them into this, this business because it's, it's pretty crazy. It's, uh, it's pretty, pretty fraught with a lot of dangers, and I, I don't want to push that on my kids. How and when did you know you wanted it? Well, I know, knew it pretty early, you know. I mean, I hate to say I probably knew it, you know, by the time I was 10 that I really liked it and I enjoyed it and was getting a lot of positive feedback. And then, of course, I went on to you know, series, like I say, in my early years, I was working with people like Debbie Reynolds and David Jansen and, you know, Lucille Ball. And, you know, these are the stories in the book that I tried to go through and talk about my experiences with Dick Van Dyke and being on his show. So by the time My Three Sons went off the air, um, you know, I was pretty serious about becoming a, a really good actor. And I went to New York, worked on Broadway, um, you know, have a lot of stories about the New York theater and working in, uh, at Kennedy Center in Washington and um, doing plays in, in New York and the theater world after that. So, um, yeah, I knew it pretty, you know, certainly by the time I was out of the show, I, I knew, okay, this is a career for me. I think I could make this work. And I was, luckily, I was getting some jobs. So that's, you know, that's important because you, you know, as, as, as good as you can be, you have to have validation that you're, that the, that the, the, People that hire you have the belief, that same belief that you're that you're going to be an asset to their project, and so you know I, I had enough of that to, to keep me going. The book is called uh, uh, "The Importance of Being Ernie: From My Three Sons to Mad Men: A Hollywood Survivor Tells All." It's written by Barry Livingston and Barry. I thank you very very much for taking the time to be on the program with us. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me on. Actor Barry Livingston. Once again, his book is entitled The Importance of Being Ernie. From My Three Sons to Mad Men, A Hollywood Survivor Tells All. You can go to my website at thestufffile.com. Go to the What's On page for this show, which is show number 0118. And you'll find links to Barry's website and also links to either Amazon.com or Amazon.ca, where you can order his book directly. You've just heard an exclusive excerpt from the Stuff File program with Peter Anthony Holder. To hear any or all of the full hour-long shows, visit thestufffile.com. Stuff is spelled S-T-U-P-H. That's thestufffile.com. A presentation of Flying Fish Communications.